What's going on, everybody? Liam O'Reilly, Vermont Economic Realtor. Hope you're doing well. Talking about the banking crisis again and something that I haven't heard anyone else talk about, which is that these small to mid-sized banks, the ones that are at risk, the ones that have failed here in the United States, although this problem also involves mid-sized banks like, like Credit Suisse, but the small and mid-sized banks uh, here in the U.S. hold almost 70% of commercial mortgages on record for, for commercial real estate. So what does that mean for these banks? How does that affect the banking system? How does that affect our economy? How does that affect you? Before we get into it, all my contact information is in the description. If you're looking to buy or sell a home in Vermont, which is where I am, or any other part of the country, reach out to me directly. I'd be happy to help you. Let's get right into it. So here's the story out of Axios. Small bank struggles could hit the real estate market hard. All right, shares of loans held by small domestic banks by select sectors. Here we go. Commercial real estate, 67.2%. And this is by small domestic banks. How they define it are small and mid-sized banks defined as domestically chartered banks, not among the 25 largest, currently hold 67.2% of outstanding commercial real estate loans and 37.6% loan, of the loans overall. So what? why does this matter to why does this matter? Why does this matter to the banks? Well, if you think about the Silicon Valley bank collapse, for example, because that's the one that's gotten the most press, right? They they bought bonds. Those bonds have gone down in value. And as their investors and depositors started to need more cash, they didn't have the cash on hand because they needed to wait for their bonds to mature in order for them to get, you know, in order for them to get access to their money because yields have risen. They're bond value dropped, so they didn't have the cash on hand to give their, to their depositors as their depositors start to withdraw. Now, why did those depositors start to withdraw? Because they are short on cash as a business, right? As they had a lot of businesses in the tech industry and those businesses needed cash immediately. They needed funding. They needed to pay their workers to, to fund their businesses. And with, you know, higher inflation, their cash was tight. So the banks, these the the people started these businesses started withdrawing money from the banks and eventually everyone caught wind that the Silicon Valley Bank's assets had depleted so they didn't have the cash on hand to fund all the depositors out there uh, which led to a bank run and and of course the collapse so how does this affect how does this commercial loan market affect other banks and are we going to see this happen across other parts of the commercial sector well in my opinion this is this is kind of a two fold system you know something else to keep in mind and this is going to come into play shortly here about 40 percent of loan officers said they had tightened lending standards in the commercial real estate space during the last quarter of 2022 so look prices are up everywhere consumers are you know with inflation they have to spend a greater portion of their money of their savings on everyday items uh, businesses have increased costs due to, to wages and also inflation. You know, money is tight for a lot of people. And so as people turn to their banks, turn to their financial institutions to withdraw funds, you know, they might be withdrawing more than usual. It's certainly something that we've seen and, and that we, we saw in Silicon Valley Bank. Um, you know, now a lot of these banks, these small to mid-sized banks, they don't only hold bonds. They also hold assets like commercial real estate. And the thing about commercial real estate is those prices have gotten to hit pretty hard as well. You know, as interest rates have risen, the cap rates, the values of commercial real estate has fallen. So these commercial real estate loans that are held on with these small to mid-sized banks are at a lower interest rate and they're, they, they're not on a 30 year fixed rate product like you have with conventional loans. They're on probably a five year, uh, variable rate, maybe a 10 year um, adjustable rate or a balloon payment after those five to 10 years. And then whoever has that product has to repay their money back to the bank. Now, if whoever has that commercial loan can't refinance at a higher rate at the loan value that they're at, you know, they're going to have to come up with, with that difference. And, and if they can't, then this bank is going to, the banks are going to start seizing these commercial assets because their borrowers are in default. Now, if we see banks, you know, if we see depositors and businesses start to need their cash and start to take their cash out of the bank, like we've seen in the past, like we saw with Silicon Valley Bank, and these small to mid-sized banks don't have 
the liquid assets to fund them if their money's tied up in things like commercial real estate, especially commercial real estate that they have to foreclose on. I, I, I could see that being a, a big issue. Now, I know the banking standards are, are different now than they were in 2008 because banks have to have more cash on hand. There's, there's stricter requirements. So there, there should be more cash in the system, but still a good portion of the commercial loans out there are held by these small to mid-sized banks. And if, if they see a massive influx of withdrawals from their accounts by their depositors, you know, they're going to be stuck with, with assets that are potentially worth, worth less than the loan that they had given out to them. So they might be taking a loss on that money that they gave. Although a lot of these commercial assets, you have to put 25 to 40% down. So you might not, they might not have to necessarily take a loss on that end, but if they can't, you know, if their person, if the, the borrower isn't going to refinance and they're forced to, you know, foreclose on the asset, then that asset is not liquid. I mean, if you think about even just the residential real estate space, people who, you know, the foreclosed homes are the homes that sit on the market the longest. And it's, it's, it's gotta be the same with commercial. I mean, I'm sure those project, those products don't move quickly and they don't move for a premium price. So let's get into this article a little bit more here. Um, so here we go. Another, this is what it says. Another huge area of office building financing, the market for commercial mortgage backed securities where banks bundle the loans and resell them to investors is seizing up, right? So the commercial backed securities that, you know, the banks get off their balance sheet and sell to investors or, uh, you know, the, for the commercial loans that they finance, or maybe the, the, they probably own some of these commercial mortgage backed securities themselves. Sales of these deals are down 85% compared to last year. So nobody wants to buy them. The price is too high for these mortgage-backed securities. Again, similar story to what happened at Silicon Valley Bank, right? The price for something for their bonds were high and then all of a sudden yields rise, prices fell. They didn't have the assets that they once did when, when yields were low. Same thing is going on with these mortgage-backed securities, especially in the commercial space where you know, especially office buildings where this work from home craze in the, the internet has really hurt a lot of these office buildings and these commercial mortgage backed securities for office spaces in particular are seizing up. So I think this could have repercussions into the regular economy. I mean, this says just right at the end, what to watch, how the pullback trickles out to regular folks in the economy. I think I mean, I think it could have similar effects just like Silicon Valley Bank. And we could see a lot of these assets decline in value. We could see banks struggling for cash because their money is tied up in, you know, especially the small banks tied up in the commercial real estate market. And then when you look at, you know, residential real estate, they own 37.5%. You know, when they say shares of loans, my guess is it must be mortgage backed securities as well as unless they're just talking about individual portfolio loans that they have on their on their balance sheet, right? Like around, like you can go to a local bank and instead of instead of getting a loan that conforms to Freddie and Fannie Mac's products, they might offer you an in-house loan that they're gonna hold on their balance sheet and they're, you know, you're an individual person. If you foreclose on their home, they're the one that, that's foreclosing. Now they can always sell that note, but it's probably in between banks. And then you have credit card loans, right? So they, these are all assets. These loans are all assets on the balance sheet. So now I'm, I'm kind of shifting topics from the commercial real estate space to what, to these, the credit cards and the auto loans that these banks hold, right? So 27% of all credit card loans, not huge, but, but still significant. And then 15.2% of all auto loans, again, not huge, but significant. As you know, if, if you've been watching this channel, if you've been following the economy, the, consumer debt market is increasing, right? So here we go, total debt, total household and credit report, household debt and credit report. So this red line is uh, non-housing debt and then the blue line is housing debt. So you can see housing debt, we're up from the peak in around 2008, we we're at about $10 trillion in housing debt and now, we're at $12 trillion, so it's gone up about 20%. In the meantime, non-housing debt has almost doubled from 2.69% up to 4.64%. So not quite double, but almost twice the amount of non-housing debt compared to what 
consumers had in 2008. And if we go back to the Federal Reserve credit card and other revolving plans, you know, this is debt that's held on commercial banks balance sheets right here, right? Credit cards, auto loans. Look, this is we're at all time highs, right? People don't have the ability to pay their loans and or to to pay their bills. So they're racking up credit cards and they, they have a lot of debt. And now what is going to happen in the commercial real estate space if you know to these local banks, if people start not being able to pay their loans, if people start defaulting on their credit card debt, if these commercial loans start to default, you know, that's not only going to affect the value of commercial real estate, it's not only going to affect the, the people that are defaulting their credit on their credit cards and have to file bankruptcy, it's going to affect these banks that are going to be taking a loss for lending out their money to to these assets, to the people that, you know, the, the assets have changed, the loans have changed, and the economy, you know, as people start to struggle in the economy and struggle with inflation, um, you know, these, the, it, it can have a really big impact on the bank. So anyway, let me know what you guys think. Liam O'Reilly, Vermont, economic realtor. I think this is pretty big. I, I haven't heard anybody else talk about it. Uh, and I think it could have significant repercussions going into the future. Again, all my contact information is in the description. Reach out to me if you're looking to buy or sell a home, especially here in Vermont. Leave a comment, please. I love hearing from you folks. Uh, I, I learn a lot from you guys. And I love, love knowing what you think. Am I right? Am I wrong? Where do you think this is heading? What do you think this means for the banking system and the economy? All right, guys. See you in the next video.